This is a picture of me when I graduated with a bachelor's degree in nursing. Little did I know then that in terms of the shape of my career to come, it would be a failure in clinical practice that would shape my program of research and lead to changes in clinical practice in the United States, Europe, Australia, and parts of Asia. But before I get to that, let me ask you a question. What will the last 10 years of your life look like? If you're lucky enough to make it to old age, will you be one of the approximately almost 40% of people 85 and older who will develop Alzheimer's disease? And if you develop cognitive impairment, will you be cared for by people who understand your altered ability to communicate and know when you are in pain, having sepsis, or developing a pulmonary embolism? Let me introduce you to some folks who didn't get it right. I worked with a group. I was responsible for quality of care in a large long-term care complex uh, with the medical director. In those days, uh, agitation associated with dementia was viewed solely as psych pathology and was treated with chemical restraints, snowing people with psychotropic drugs or physical restraints. We had one woman who had reverted to only speaking Yiddish, so we had communication difficulties. She had many screaming behaviors, sucked air through her teeth, and I remember trying to finish irrigating her catheter before she would um, stick her fingernails in my arm. We were trying to improve her quality of life, so we put her in music therapy and observing toddlers playing with their moms. Um, eventually, the woman died, and the family asked for an autopsy. Um, the medical director came to my office and said the autopsy results were in. She had a belly full of cancer. We should have been treating her with large doses of morphine. At that time, we thought that her behaviors were psychiatric in origin, and we had really failed this resident, and she had died a difficult death. I started doing a series of studies to better understand behaviors of people with dementia and factors associated with inadequate assessment and treatment. I'll share just a few of the findings from those early studies that led to our interventions and major changes in thinking about behaviors assessment and treatment. Imagine communicating your pain by trying to get away from it get out of bed, get out of the wheelchair, get off the nursing home unit. No one understands that you are in pain and that's what you're communicating, communicating so you're scolded and left to suffer. That's what our research found. Imagine getting awakened in the morning, feeling assaulted by a shower and rough scrubbing, taken to eat and then to an activity. Your agitation caused by a lack of understanding of environmental stress thresholds is treated with a tranquilizer that leaves you feeling bad for the rest of the day. Imagine calling out for help, saying, something is wrong, something is wrong, and your nurse responds by speaking gently to you and turning on your television set. Three days later, you are diagnosed as septic because your urinary tract infection has now entered your entire bloodstream. Consistent with my Yiddish lady from the past, our studies found three things. People who had impaired communication were woefully under-assessed and under under-treated. Specific behaviors were communicating pain and other unmet needs, and treating intractable behaviors with analgesics led to huge improvements in function and behavior. I was pretty radical in developing this NIH-funded intervention by forcing behavioral symptoms to be followed by assessment, forcing prescribers to go through five steps before considering giving a psychotropic, and in select situations, using analgesics as a part of the assessment process. We conducted two multi-site large randomized controlled trials that showed huge improvements in um, pain, comorbid problems, agitation, and improvements in the physiological stress hormone cortisol. But we also found a troubling problem we called static care, in which people continued to be given the same ineffective interventions over and over again. 
we began a new series of studies that found too many treatments were started and were never stopped or altered based on changing needs. Continuing to give treatments that are not needed, ineffective, potentially associated with side effects, or inconsistent with changing goals of care is not benign. It creates a physiological burden and can exceed the person's stress threshold. We developed and tested an intervention to track treatment effectiveness and force consideration of stopping treatments under the four conditions I just mentioned. It saved money, got many treatments stopped, and some new, more needed treatments started. Currently, I am working with a team at the University of Pennsylvania, Emory, and Johns Hopkins Sleep Centers, as well as UT Austin. For the first time, we now have a method of diagnosing a painful nighttime uh, neurological disorder called restless leg syndrome in people with dementia. The number one reason that people enter long-term care is that the caregivers can no longer tolerate the nighttime agitation and sleep problems in their family member with dementia. In our current study, 86% of the folks who meet our initial eligibility criteria are testing positive for L RLS. If this treatment is effective, it can save a lot of money, keep people at home longer. Well, this is my last slide. Here's hoping that you and I have a period of old age and that we're healthy for a long period of old age and that we're able to compress our period of morbidity. Thank you.